Okay, everybody, we're on to session 2.6, the last session of unit two. Aren't you so happy? And we're leaving taxes behind now, too. We're just, we're going to just now be talking about other regulations. And so these aren't tax issues, but they fit nicely within this because taxes feel so regulatory. We might as well talk about some other regulatory issues as well. So let's talk about the requirements for incorporation, why they're important to stay on top of. It's simple but important. We're going to talk about something called qualifying to do business, which is how you operate in other states. So if you're a Utah corporation operating in California, you probably have to qualify to do business there. And we're going to talk about what that process entails. Uh, we're going to talk about getting a business license in municipalities. If you operate within a city or town, you probably have to get a business license there. And then we're going to talk about this last thing, the thing that is going to bother most of you because it should. And it's, it's something called charitable solicitation registration, which is the law in 40 states. And we need to understand how that works. This is an area of the law where most nonprofits are in non-compliance, which is a crazy reality. Okay. So let's talk about what the things you have to do in your home state. You have to, for example, maintain your corporate charter. This is your legal authority to exist. This is what you get when you file your articles of incorporation. But those articles are only good for a year unless you renew. And the renewal process is really simple. Generally in Utah, what happens is you get sent a little postcard with a web link typed on it. And if you go to that web link, you'll log in and you can pay your fee for a nonprofit. It's pretty cheap. I want to say it's like $20 a year to renew your, your corporate status. If you fail to renew, you go into a three-month probationary period. And if you fail to renew during the probationary period, you are automatically dissolved as a corporation. A lot of organizations let this slip by. It's like a detail that they don't stay on top of, and because of it, they don't maintain these entities. And by failing to maintain their entity, they're technically they're legally dissolved. If you remember when we talked about the organizational test for nonprofits, if you're tax exempt, the, you have a provision in your document that says upon dissolution, you'll pay all of your resources out to some other nonprofit or to the government. This is legally the requirement that would be in effect if you dissolve. Now, there's some leniency here with the IRS. If you're accidentally dissolved, but you can convince the state to allow for you to be reincorporated, the IRS will treat you as though you have been incorporated during that entire time period. But if you're sloppy about it, this could definitely come and catch you. So make sure you stay on top of it and you renew your corporate registration on an annual basis. And then the other thing to pay attention to is that if you operate in a specific city or town, you probably have to get a business license. This is usually also an annual filing. It sometimes comes with a fee for nonprofits, but generally speaking, nonprofits are, are the fee is waived for them. The licensing requirement is not waived. You still have to get a business license. You just don't have to pay the fee for it. And the main reason that localities do this, it relates to zoning. They want to make sure that businesses are operating within the zoning rules for that area that they're operating. And a business licensing process is a way they can verify that that's the case. Okay, so what about when you're operating in other states? This is where that idea of qualifying to do business comes into effect. If you're a Utah corporation operating elsewhere, then you have to register in the states where you're operating. And the reason is because those other states want to be able to grab you with their laws, and they do this by requiring you to register. So if you are based in Utah but operate in Wyoming, then you have to qualify to do business there. And it's an annual filing process. And, and you might be wondering, like, when do you have to do this? What counts as operating in another state? Well, it's when your contacts in that state exceed some level. Examples of things that would require you to qualify to do business in another state. If you have a bank account there, if you have an office location there, or employees who work for you there, or you engage in substantial commerce there then you have to qualify to do business in those states. So the gap, for example, I like to pick on the gap. I don't know why. The gap is a, is a California-based corporation, but they have lots of stores in Utah. That means they have to qualify to do business in Utah. And this is an annual filing that they do that you could look up online if you wanted to. And so because they because they meet three out of these four requirements, they have an office location here. They may even have a bank account, but they definitely have employees and they definitely engage in substantial commerce. And for that reason, the gap, even though they're not incorporated in Utah, they do have to qualify to do business here. The upside for the gap is it allows them to use Utah courts to sue people. And um, and so uh, what, what that means is that... Uh, 
is that if an employee did something wrong, the, the, the gap would be able to take advantage of Utah courts to enforce the law. Okay. And that's it. That's qualifying to do business. This is, um, this is something you have to do. Nonprofits have to do it too. If they meet any of those requirements of sufficient contacts, then they have to qualify to do business in the states where they're operating. Okay, so the last one we're going to talk about is charitable solicitation registration. This is not required in all states, but it's required in most states, 40 states to be specific. This is a registration process you have to go through in order to be allowed to solicit donations. If you're asking people for donations, you have to register in these 40 states on an annual basis. A National Tax Journal article assessed this a little over a decade ago, and it estimated that the compliance cost is with, with um, the preparation cost plus the fees that have to be paid is about $1.1 billion for the industry, or on average $4,300 per charity. <clears throat> um, there's a group of state attorneys general that reviewed the legal issue on this, wondering what counts as a solicitation. And what they found is that, generally speaking, a website asking for donations is a, a solicitation in all 40 of these states unless the charity disclaims their intent to raise money from that state. So you say this, this fundraising page is intended for residents of, and you identify the states where it's intended, if, if a resident of a state where you hadn't registered submits a donation, you're okay because you didn't want them to get that solicitation. But um, this is why most charities in the United States do not comply with these laws. How bad is it if you don't comply? Well, in Utah, um, it's a Class B misdemeanor for every day that you solicit donations. And not just, a, it's a Class B misdemeanor for all of the board members of the nonprofit. So the best thing to do is to actually register. Um, but sadly, registration is complex and expensive. You could do it yourself by downloading all the state forms. This is very time consuming. I actually did this one summer as a, as a law student. I clerked at a nonprofit in DC called Grameen Foundation USA. And I worked under the general counsel. And one of my jobs that summer was to register in all 40 states. And it took me about three and a half weeks of full-time work um, doing only that. So that's a very expensive and time-consuming process. There was a group of state charity officers called NASCO that um, attempted to streamline this registration mess all into one form. <clears throat> the idea was to avoid redundancy of having to file all these different forms that had fundamentally the same information. Sadly, this process doesn't actually simplify that much because there are other state requirements like different filing dates, different fees you have to pay. Some states require an addendum on top of the URS form. And so the, the reality is this is not, this doesn't make things that much better. So what some nonprofits do is they just go pay a professional. They pay a lawyer account to do this for them. It usually costs between seven to twelve thousand um, dollars fees and everything all in to get this organization to get the law firm to do this for you. There are some national law firms that specialize in this. There's one called Couple of It's in Cantor in Kansas City that's really good at it. Um, there's another one called Webster Chamberlain and Bean in D.C. Um, and I'd recommend either of those if your nonprofit wants to pay somebody to do this for you. To kind of give you a sense of how complex this is, I prepared this chart. I prepared it over a decade ago, and some of these requirements have changed. So this isn't a reflection of the current law, but it shows you how complex it is. So pick a random state, let's say Mississippi. Oh, Mississippi's a doozy. For Mississippi to be in compliance, you have to pay an annual fee. You have to use a unique state form, meaning you cannot use the URS. Um, you have to provide a copy of your tax exempt letter from the IRS. You have to provide a copy of all fundraiser contracts. You have to provide a copy of your bylaws. If you amend your bylaws, you have to provide a new copy. You have to provide a copy of your articles of incorporation and amended ones if, if, if applicable. You have to provide a, a copy of your 990 every year. You have, to you have to get an outside accounting firm to do an audit of your finances and provide a copy of that audit to the state. And the forms that you file have to be signed in front of a notary public who verifies that your CEO actually signed these forms. I mean, this is all a royal pain in the butt. 
We're going to talk about the policy issues of this, whether or not states should be allowed to do this, why they do it, why haven't the laws changed, uh, are there really any benefits to this, what are the drawbacks, we're going to talk through all that. But that's it as far as the as other um, regulations are concerned, and I look forward to seeing you all in class.